All right, so we're joined on the line now by Christian Heilman from, uh, who's from Poland. He's, well, he's not from Poland. He's uh, a German who's visiting Poland at the moment. But uh, you're the uh, principal evangelist at Mozilla. So what does that involve? Well, it involves a lot of traveling. That's why I'm in Poland at the moment. I'm based actually in London, but I am, uh, yeah, I'm a German, so the action, the accent is all over the place. So uh, my job is actually to go out to the world and tell people what uh, we're doing. And my first focus was the open web and HTML5 in itself, which is a great opportunity to work for somebody like Mozilla because an, a foundation that was actually started to make the web better gives you a great starting point to, op- uh, to talk about open technologies rather than having to shoehorn it into the agenda of your company. Hmm. And how, how did you come to get involved with Mozilla then? Um, I've been a friend of Mozilla for a long, long time. I've been, uh, I've always been like the uh, let's not let's let's try this open technology first. I've been a Netscape fan. I like the idea of uh, of view source really easily in the beginning. And uh, yeah, so when I when I was got bored in my last job, the Mozilla guys came up and said like, you know what, we want somebody to talk about HTML5 and to get people involved in open technologies from the get-go, would that be something for you? And I have to say, the the job interview was like six hours of the best brainstorming I've done in a while, so it it just felt completely natural going there. <laughs> cool, cool. Hmm. Um, one, one, one quick question, since, you, since you're from Germany, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Nuremberg area originally, ah. a, small, a small village called Graf Reinfeld with 3,000 people and a nuclear power plant and fishes with different uh, number of eyes and things like that. It was really interesting. <laughs> well, that's, Basic- yeah, they're, they're going to shut that down soon. Yeah, basically that got me involved in computers. I wanted to get out as soon as possible, so I started sending floppy disks around on a Commodore 64 and later on had a BBS running on a Commodore 64. And yeah, then later on I started working for the radio, the local radio, to make some money and be involved with the media. And then I found the internet and said like, hey, that's a better medium to support. So that's how I started my career. And how how did you get from there to, to come to work for Mozilla? That's been a long, long trip till then. I mean, I've worked for uh, uh, for different agencies. I worked for eToys in the U.S. for a while, which was like Amazon for toys. Um, I worked then for Yahoo for four years. And before that, for an agency in London, building things like McDonald's, Coded UK, and VisitBritain.com. So I worked my way through all the uh, closed uh, enterprise-level content management systems up to open technologies again. And I thought it's a it's a much better idea to do that because I know now when I release something, I give it out for free immediately, which means if I get hit by a big red bus, it will still be available rather than in some documentation that people have to pay for. So are, are you a developer as well then? Do you code and stuff and, and do t- oh, yeah, technical of stuff? Of course. Of course, my, my, my background is a web developer. I was lead web developer in Yahoo, and I was a front-end architect in Yahoo. And uh, I think that's what a developer evangelist really should be doing. It should be somebody technical that can speak and has a drive not to shut up about technologies. And it's a, it's more or less a translation job between techies and non-techies inside and outside the company. Because a lot of times companies build things that uh, fit their agenda but not really fit the needs of developers out there. So it needs someone in between that says, like, well, this is great, but if we do it like this, then people can really use it. Mm. So... I've written actually a handbook on it at developer-evangelism.com, which is Creative Commons and uh, also on GitHub in case you want to translate it into other languages. And uh, that one is basically written for when I worked at Yahoo, the guys in the uh, in the Brazil office wanted to, uh, to have training on developer evangelism and I couldn't find time to fly over there. So I spent two afternoons to write that handbook and send it out and release it out there. And that is partly also how Mozilla found me and said like, dude, this is amazing. Can we... How about you join us and you do all the things for free like that? And I'm like, that's a good idea. So why not? Well, very cool. So um, we have to ask, being called Linux Outlaws, do you, obviously the, all the Mozilla products are supported on Linux. So is, is Linux an important kind of uh, platform to Mozilla? Yeah, uh, definitely. The, the Most of our development machines are Linux machines, actually. I mean, I'm on a Mac because I'm, uh, I have to do like all kind of like text editing and stuff as well. But uh, my machine at home is Linux machine as well. The problem is right now with Linux is the, the hardware drivers and uh, hardware acceleration on Linux is just not as good as it can be uh, on others, which actually annoys me because 
uh, right now for when you do like WebGL things, like proper 3D web stuff, Windows is becoming the more interesting platform again, and I just couldn't go back. But uh, it was in, it's interesting to test for it at the moment. So don't, don't, the hardware stuff is something that we have to ramp up in the Linux world, I guess. Don't you think that will change now? That my, I mean, Microsoft just came out recently said that you know they they really they didn't really want to do WebGL because it's so insecure and stuff. Yeah, um, well, that's uh, that's basically they're, they're defending their own product, which is a good, which is a, a totally understandable stance because I mean they have their own 3D platform that already proved itself on uh, Xbox, so they're supporting that. But uh, it still means that the 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 low level APIs to reach hardware acceleration are easier to reach than on other platforms. Mm, okay. there's already a, there's already a way in, so to say, you know. But I mean, to mm. me, it's like uh, to me, it's like I, I really don't mind that much because I'm uh, I think the web technologies that I'm working with they are independent of operating system as well. The implementation is just varying for, in, in quality, but it's still to me if you write something that only works on one operating system on the web, you're doing it wrong. And when uh, when when some companies say I need to buy a certain piece of hardware or a certain piece of software to see something that they put on the web, then they haven't understood the web in my book. Mm. Yeah, one thing I have noticed, I mean, I work with Windows machines um, I'm at, at my job, a part-time job, and, um, you know, we, we install Firefox on all the machines, obviously. And one thing I've noticed is that, especially, I think, with Firefox 5, or maybe even with 4 already, um, it started to look pretty different on Windows which I guess is, you know, probably due to the window manager, but um, I would guess so. I mean, did most you have problems uh, there with um, you know most that? most browsers look different from uh, looks look slightly different from operating system to operating system. But that's the actually the benefit of it. Like when we can, and uh, every browser vendor does that. When we can, we take the native controls and display them because they're already optimized for the operating system. We don't have to simulate them. The other benefit, of course, is that when these controls are used from the operating system, then the accessibility of them is higher as well because they tie into the APIs that talk to things like screen readers, screen zooming software, voice recognition, these kind of things. So a lot of the things that we put on the web to make look the same across all platforms actually hurt the usability of them but uh, uh, as a designer, a lot of people want that. So I totally realize that browsers look different from operating system to operating system. But then again, uh, you're in the IT department world where you're basically installing software for other people. You're the only person that actually realizes that. It always cracks me up when people say, oh, have you tested this in, in uh, across these different browsers and operating system? Does it look the same everywhere? And uh, my answer is that's the wrong way of approach because... If it looks the same everywhere, then you actually cater to the lowest common denominator rather than taking advantage of what different platforms and different browsers allow you to do, which is something that web technologies to me always were uh, catered for. They were they were there to actually um, find out what you have and then use it to its best of its abilities. Nowadays, we're running around with, op uh, with mobile phones in our pockets that are faster than some of the machines that I used to uh, program on. And uh, when the when we can't use this uh, kind of uh, computing power and memory, why do we have them? And that's the benefit of just uh, having these APIs to talk directly into the operating system. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that that's a good point. I, I think it's it's pretty much a different approach from what Google's doing with Chrome. I think they they're going uh, pretty much the opposite way. Um, I, that that looks pretty pretty the same on 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 windows and and on linux so um but i i, I think the, the the accessibility argument is definitely a very important one well the other problem the other thing not problem the other benefit that google had is that uh, with chrome they're actually playing uh, follow up they can learn from all the mistakes yeah. that other people have done and don't have to repeat them which is great which is a great position to be in and they're doing a great job with it i'm actually rather excited about the chromebooks i'm i'm getting one uh, uh, delivered while i'm here somewhere in England, so that's going to be a UPS pickup fun thing again. But um, I like the idea of making hardware a commodity and uh, basically offering companies a $28 a month approach to say, like, you get laptops and people can work with them rather than having to spend lots of money on infrastructure and IT infrastructure because 
to me, the enemies of the web right now, or the, what we could do with the web, are these like companies that have 6,000 Windows XP machines that just don't upgrade and force people to use Internet Explorer 6 and not upgrade to another browser because the software that they've developed the last eight years only works on IE6. And that, to me, is just not helpful to anybody. And uh, I think disrupting that market with an offering with hardware that has already an operating system in it is a great idea. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's that's a that's a good point. Um, I mean, you, when when you talk about this, um, I mean, that just like I think a few days ago, the news broke out of Mozilla um, about that new uh, boot to Gecko uh, project. Can can you talk about that a bit? Do you you know do you know anything about that? It seems to be pretty new. Uh, it is very new. We um, we discussed a few of these things in the past, and I agreed that uh, it, that the web is moving away from just a desktop to going into a mobile world as well and if we don't uh, if we don't have an open offering that allows us to actually access all the hardware and the different APIs that different systems give us we don't have a chance to do that right now the mobile market is uh, is basically dominated by a few closed companies and it's just not it's just not nice that that should be should not be the case i should not have to tie into one monolithic system just to get a good uh, uh, get a good experience on a mobile phone. I should not have to write native code for five different uh, operating systems on mobile phones and test with 300 different handsets to get a good experience out of it. So what the uh, what the, the B2G pro, uh, project basically means uh, is that we that we want to build an operating system that actually brings the web to all these devices rather than just simulate uh, uh, simulate the tech, the uh, the functionality that uh, native uh, code gets, and that's just to me unfair. I mean, I should I should be allowed to access a, a, a camera in JavaScript with a proper security model around it. But as that's a, a very hard task to do right, we just said, okay, let's do it, let's start it. And there's no way that somebody can build an operating system like that in the dark, and then after two years come out and say like, ta-da, it's perfect. So we just have an approach that we started, keep it completely open and give people the steps, what we're doing, and of course ask for um, participation, much like we did with Firefox as well. Firefox would not be Firefox if we hadn't uh, uh, released it to the outside world and have all our contributors and localizers and people out there. That's what makes it a great product. We could hire a crack team and just put it in the corner and say like, oh, you build awesome right now. But I think it makes much more sense to have it out in the world and let everybody's imagination and creativity flow and give us the information that we need. So so I guess this is aimed at mobiles, um, at, at, at phones primarily. It sounds like, not like um, Chrome OS, which is more, you know, for netbooks. Yeah, Chrome, Chrome OS is more catered to the desktop, and as I say, as I said, it is its job is to disrupt the desktop market. And thanks very much, that's a good idea. Uh, but what our uh, what our uh, project more wants to have is the the tablet and the mobile market to make it more webby, to bring the web to the mobile market rather than uh, uh, lots and lots of close technologies that you have to learn and be an expert in. It it reminds me of the uh, of the 90s when when you wanted to be part of a content management system world, you had to learn all these different closed technologies and then be a uh, uh, be a contractor or be a consultant in these environments. But in in essence, it's content management system and uh, open source solutions there as well prove that something like Drupal can be actually scaled to a, a, a mid to large size company if you do it right, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. We bring the web to these devices and we bring the openness to these uh, software technologies. Mm. So I was interested that you, you talk about the, the openness there. Um, I've heard um, from a few people just kind of anecdotal evidence that sometimes it can be hard to contribute to some of the Mozilla products because most of the developers are within Mozilla. So do you get a lot of uh, patches and things from outside Mozilla and do people collaborate? Yeah, they do. I mean, I'm not part of the development team of Firefox, so I'm uh, my job is basically to sit outside uh, uh, the company and bring the ideas of openness to other companies out there which are not that uh, um, a par for the course yet. Um, I heard I heard things like that before, but a lot of these this feedback is also developers. I mean, 
our internal developers are also developers much like anybody else out there. So when somebody's patch doesn't get put in in the first two days, people think they actually have been rejected. But it might just be that the other person is just really, really busy. And with our new release schedule, we are really, really busy. So <laughs> it's a matter of... Uh, it's a matter of really uh, understanding where people come from and make, maybe poking them once more, sending another email will normally give you the result. I mean, I get the same feedback in the HTML5 working group where people say like, hey, if you're not part of a browser vendor, nobody listens to you. And that's just not true. And there's, uh, there's proof that people are listened to even if they're not uh, from inside. And I think uh, 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 everybody in Mozilla that I talk to is very, very much aware that we wouldn't be anywhere without our contributors. And I just love the scale of that. I mean, I came from a 14,000 people company and I came to Mozilla and I realized it's like 400 people, the whole company, and the rest is is from contributors. And seeing that we build together things like Firefox 4 and now Firefox 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, it's just wonderful to see. And that's partly why I started there as well. I had offers from other companies as well, but I just wanted to be part of where anybody can come up with a great idea and does get listened to. Mm. So you mentioned the new release schedule a few times. Um, can can you talk about that? What what you know what what internally went on? Why why do you decided to change that? Well, we decided to change that because we realized that the step from uh, Firefox three to Firefox four was just taking far too long. People were uh, people were we were losing people to other browsers because they innovated faster. They had different things that people wanted immediately. And we just realized that the world is moving faster than uh, than a browser just coming out every half year with a big tada and saying like, "Hey, we got it right now." So we uh, we shifted from the normal uh, beta and release cycle to four different channels that you actually can be part of. So we got nightly builds, we got the Aurora build, which is always a experimental build of the next features that go into the beta. Then we have the beta, and which is actually shipped out to everybody out there, not only people that subscribe to the developer channels. And we got the main releases, which are for mom and dad users out there that should not have to know about new browser versions, but should just get a, a new browser that works for them. So right now we ship every six weeks a new version in the Aurora channel and in other channels. And it's, uh, it's of course, pushing us to a limit and a lot of people get confused about this. But to me, it's uh, th that's, the, that's the nature of the web. That's the wonderful thing about the web. When I want to have a new operating system, I have to download 2.7 gig and install that. With the web, I just go somewhere and it automatically updates and it gives me the newest fixes. So if we want to be... Uh, on par with both the competition and with the innovation that's happening and the security patches that we need, then we basically should be moving faster and everybody should. I'm, I want to have a world where end users don't care what version their browser is, but just get it updated when, it when, when they go online and it works for them. The biggest problem I found in the world as a web developer is that people just don't upgrade their computers yeah. and their their browsers. And especially with Internet Explorer, if the browser is connected with the operating system, if you don't great upgrade your operating system, your browser gets stuck in 1999. That's just not fun. So are you planning to um, change the update model of Firefox uh, to a way like, I mean, if, with, with Chrome, nobody actually notices because it just updates in the background. It also updates major versions. Is that planned for Firefox in the future? Yes, we're, we're, we're planning on a silent update as well. It's a hard to fix problem at the, at the, mo at the moment because the original Firefox platform was not built that way. But mm -hmm. with the new add-on uh, SDK, we, we took first step into that direction that we will upgrade Firefox silently. I'm not, as I said, I'm not part of that team. I can't make a promise here, but that's yeah, what sure. I'm pushing. That's what I'm pushing for completely because I think the browser should just upgrade without me having to say yes or no, or I, I can opt in to say if I want to upgrade. But in the end, how, how does it make an end user's life better if he knows that his Firefox is 4.78 or 5.32? That's only information that is necessary for developers and they can get that through the navigation app string rather than just the version number of the browser itself I'd rather have an uh, have a platform that uh, that has new technologies in there when they come out rather than having to wait for my for my customers all to upgrade before I can use them 
it's always been this like as a web developer you always look out of the window and you see this this cool new technologies that you in your own little world talk about but the end users out there can't use yet and with a constant update flow of browsers we can finally do that the browsers are the platforms nowadays and we use more and more on the client side so it makes just sense to update that so yes the the goal is definitely to have a silent update for end users, but we're not quite there yet. Um, the promises that I get are for eight and uh, end of the year that we finally will be there, that there won't be any difference between the Chrome updates and the Firefox updates anymore. And I think it's a great idea. Mm. Cool. So, so I guess that also answers the criticism that some people had when Firefox 5 came out and you changed your own release. Like, I mean, lots of people uh, were saying that you just did that to like increase numbers, you know, um, as a, as a marketing tool, and I mean, it sounds like um, when you're saying end users shouldn't really know about the numbers, that, that that's like the totally different approach. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think it's boring to basically tell users that there's a new version of that out, new version of that out. I mean, Opera has been going through so many releases in so many years, and users of Opera always upgraded without asking. And I'd, uh, I mean, it's not that many users, granted, but it's just, it's just, that was always great for me as a developer to say, I know that these people update. And Chrome went from like zero to 10 versions or 12 versions in like two years or one year. So um, it, it's just getting silly. I mean, like we could then have a release party for Firefox 27, 28. But uh, in, the, in essence, it's just necessary for the end user out there. And uh, I th I'm quite sure that if we look at operating systems as well, you show people Ubuntu, most of the users out there won't be able to tell you what version it is or really don't care. They just want to see that their stuff works. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, something that Mozilla have been uh, always involved in really is standards, which you talked about, web standards and um, now HTML5 and all that kind of stuff. I noticed that... Um, <clears throat> Firefox um, natively supports things like Og Theora and WebM Open Video Codex, but doesn't support H.264. So is that a standards thing? Is that a standards position from, from Mozilla? It's a standards position, but it's also a copyright position because H.264 could be changed from under us in 2012, I think, already. So uh, it says now it's free. It says now it's open, which is good. But uh, uh, when you look through the paperwork, and again, there's specialists out there, not me, that understand that much more, uh, then we know that it's not really free and it's not really open. And, and that's why uh, that's why my, uh, Google also came up with their WebM uh, a technology in WebP, which I haven't used yet or seen anybody use, but I think it's just not fair that we uh, that we have to pay for encoding content and that there is. Uh, I mean, I've always been this like open source hippie, mm -hmm. and I don't believe in closed technologies and IPs that much. I mean, uh, big corporations love their intellectual property and filing uh, uh, and, and find their patents because that's what they can do to show off to their uh, to the to their uh, uh, stockholders. But in essence, like if I if it takes five years to make a patent for something, so in these five years it stops. There's no innovation going on there. And H.264 uh, is a great format, and what uh, what Apple is doing with uh, delivering it on iPad in like with the adaptive streaming and these things, there's great great technology in there, but it's just not open, and that's why we can't support it in a completely open product. Same with MP3. That's why we now actually have an mp3.js renderer that actually decodes MP3 in JavaScript rather than natively in the browser. Mm. Does does that add um, an overhead, a performance overhead at all with the extra JavaScript? Yeah, of course. But uh, seeing that the, uh, the how fast the, uh, uh, the the JavaScript engines are these days, I mean, with uh, uh, with Jagermonkey and the next one coming out as well, it's not that much of an overhead anymore. And uh, I mean, I remember when I was on Windows in my old, uh, in my young years, and I played an MP3. That WinAmp on some of my machines just couldn't make it; it couldn't play it, and I had to write a or find a, a light, lighter player to also play that. Decoding stuff is really hard. What I really want to have, and that's partly what uh, uh, what the whole uh, uh, web. Uh, 
uh, web to gecko thing is going on as well. I really want hardware to care about these things for me. I want it to be actually decompressed and displayed on the hardware. And right now, H.264 is embedded in hardware, but uh, uh, but WebM isn't. And that's something that we should be striving for, because in the end, it is the job of the video card and the sound card to play this stuff, not us to have to simulate it. But as it's not open technology, we cannot support it. And it annoys me, because... HTML5 video to me is uh, is one of the biggest liberators of the web at the moment, and uh, uh, we we just can't use one format for all browsers. We have to create the video in like, if you think about it, 17 different formats to support all browsers and mobile devices in the to the best of their abilities, and that's just not a fun way of dealing with it. There's a great service called Vidly. Um, which actually does that for you. You up, just upload your video there and it converts it to all the formats for you and the Vidly URL it creates then redirects you to the right format according to which operating system and device you're on. And that's something that we should be striving for to have that as an open platform as well. Mm. So w- we had a, a long uh, political process with HTML5 trying to decide on a default video codec and Apple were pushing H.264 obviously as their technology. Other people were trying to push Og Theora and, and alternatives. So was it a, a problem for you that it didn't, we never got a, an actual standard out of that or, or you know you can still choose your codec? I don't, you know, as a web developer, I don't care that much really because when I when I impl- when I put an image inside a website, I uh, use GIF, I use JPEG, I, I use PNG. PNG is the only fully open uh, version of that, and uh, a JPEG as well. But I think only after a few years, GIF was a was a copyrighted format because the LZW compression algorithm inside GIF was a copyright issue. That's why a lot of pieces of software that were completely free again could not generate GIFs, for example. So GIMP had that problem for years. So um, I think there is a good opportunity that we have different formats, that there will never be a time where we use one format to rule them all. But it's, uh, I think it's very important that uh, that Google and, and Mozilla and other people are out there to actually battle and say, like, you know what, this is great, your format, but if you don't open it, uh, people can't build free software with it. So uh, there should be something that is as good and is free, and that's what we're having right now. Mm, mm. Excellent. And um, so, so you think it will become just as images have become in, in the web? Because they were never actually standardized on a format. So you think in future people will just continue to pick their favorite codec, if you like, and, and that will work okay? I think it gets more into into a use case uh, a scenario because, for example, right now with HTML5 video, you cannot stop people from downloading the video. Uh, HTML5 in YouTube is doing something with a proxy that they actually send it through and don't allow you to download the whole video. But anybody who knows a bit about HTTP streaming knows how to get away get around that. So, if you want to have DRM. In your videos, if you want to make sure that only one person on a certain piece of hardware can watch that, then uh, Flash and also H.264 will be your friends. So that's uh, there's a whole market of people out there that don't want their stuff open. So for them, uh, these formats will be the better choice, and that's great because... I mean, for good luck to them, because um, I find that as soon as it shows on a screen, it can be downloaded in one way or another. But uh, it's just you cannot go to an NBC or to a CNN and say, like, by the way, you should put all your videos online for free right now so anybody can download them. <laughs> That's just not going to fly with them. So we need different formats and different approaches. And sadly enough, right now, in the HTML5 video world, nobody's thinking about an open source DRM which is possible because there are cryptography uh, uh, and uh, and encryption algorithms that are open mm. so it is a, there is a possibility there but regardless of the fact that personally i think that drm is completely failed much like a regional encoding of dvds failed um, it it doesn't matter people need that and people if you want to have the big players on the side of open technology we have to start thinking about that as well mm. but how how would you implement that i mean i guess the problem with with drm is always that you know to to play it you basically have to give the people who are playing it the key to uh, you know to, to to play it so so you can all always all also break the drm with that Right. Well, I'm not. I'm not here to protect DRM because I think that's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a losing battle. It's just. Uh, I think it's just. Uh, 
I, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you both live in England as well. If I download stuff that only work on a certain iPod and I get that iPod stolen and it means I have to rebuy all these things, that doesn't work. I mean, I don't trust hardware. I, it had let me down so many times. That's why I love to put my stuff on the web because at least it's backed up somewhere. So um, I, I think it's much more interesting to put content behind a paywall then encode the content itself. Mm. I mean, it's always the thing about uh, you had it with with designers as well, and photographers was the best. I, I had so many photographers come up to me and say, "Can you build me a website?" And I'm like, "Sure, I can." And how can I make sure that people can't download my images? And I'm like, "Well, you put them on a memory stick and leave them in your desk. That's the only way, so you can stop people from downloading your images. Because mm. as soon as they're on a screen, I can always make a screenshot." Like put a put a big ass uh, uh, um, watermark on there, then it actually advertises for you while people are sending it around the around the uh, the web. I think distribution is much more interesting than actually protecting your content from being distributed. I find it with my texts when I release them as Creative Commons, I find that people translate my things, and otherwise I would have to pay a translator for that. Every book that I've written, IT book, mind you, not like Harry Potter and these kind of things, <laughs> I, every IT book I've written, I found a day later as a pirated PDF on the web. And I sent those URLs to my uh, to my publishers and they said, like, you know what, it really does not make a difference in sales for the paperback because people that actually download the PDF most likely get excited and buy the book if it's good if it's good enough. So it's a bit of a try before you buy a thing. Mm. I think with the e- with the ebook market now, it's a different story. But again, rather than having a file format that tries to encrypt that in the file format itself, it would be much more interesting to look into hardware, decrypting it and encrypting it for you on that hardware itself on a chip level rather than having to, f- to put it in the format itself. Mm. And what, one big thing that, that we come across as um, broadcasters is um, lots of the, the ways of broadcasting video and so on through websites is done with Flash right now. And um, people keep saying that it's at the moment HTML5 doesn't have the capabilities to grab your webcam and do all these things that you know you want to do. So um, is that fair, do you think, or, or, or is that just coming down the pipeline now, uh, being able to do all that? That is exactly what the B2G uh, uh, project is about. That is exactly what we're trying to actually make work right now, that we get uh, that we get access to these levels. Right now, if you want to access a webcam, you really need to have Flash or you need to go through Java or some other thing. There's a plugin for Firefox called uh, Rainbow, which is from our labs project that allows you to actually access the camera and the, the microphone. And that's uh, that is uh, a build there as well. But again, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of security concerns in there as well. Like, what if I can start recording your audio without you realizing it? What if I can start your camera without the light flashing up and these kind of things? And it's amazing how many people are. Uh, uh, as soon as you talk about these things, are just like, oh my god, the internet is spying on me, and we're all gonna die, and it's not gonna happen any time that we that is gonna be a good. Thing, but these are the same people that are that are happy to say like, well, this is a, this flash game wants to have to a camera. Do you want to say yes to that? Sure, I'm quite sure they don't record anything in the background here. It's all fine. Um, the other thing, of course, is that with like we discussed this before we actually started recording here, that I still have to find one uh, one uh, webcast system that really works with the infrastructures that we have right now. I hang out a lot in hotel rooms where the connectivity is bad or I'm over wireless. And uh, every time I do a webcast, something gets out of sync and people ask questions and say, like, I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> it's like we're actually quite lucky that so far it, ha- it happened with that recording that we didn't have that problem. So um, Flash has done a lot of good work in optimizing that and a lot of the learnings that they had a lot of the findings that the flash world has done can now be reused in open technologies and that's good and i think it's just uh, uh, to turn that argument around i always uh, there's so many haters out there in the html5 world that basically say flash should die and we should replace it and everything and it's just another technology layer. It's just like, I'm sorry, what people do in .NET might be good for Mono. What people do in uh, Windows might be a good idea for Linux as well. It's all a, a conversation piece. 
that it's harder to get the information out of the Flash community because all of it was closed source and like made sure that if I know how to do that effect, I'm going to be the contractor for that project and you're not. That's a different that's a different discussion. But I think it's just a matter of using the right technology for the right job. And uh, so more and more, we manage to learn from closed technologies and what they've done wrong and do it better in open formats right now. A great example for that are the file APIs in HTML5. To, to upload a file on the web, we always had a single file with a single form submission, and that's just not fun. And then we had Flash uh, uh, solutions and Java solutions that allow us to pick a folder or pick several files and upload them one at a time and have like a progress bar, how far they've been uploaded and allow for, uh, uh, for resuming of an upload. And all of these things went into the file APIs of HTML5, and now we can do that natively without having to rely on a plugin. Because a plugin was always the issue. I mean, uh, when in my talks, I normally say a plugin is like patching potholes in a street rather than putting a new layer of uh, uh, of tarmac on it to make it really a, a highway that you can drive on. So uh, I have to rely on my client, on my end users to update or their their plugins all the time as well. And the, all the security problems we had in the last few years, a lot of them, were actually because of plugins and uh, giving you more access to things that you shouldn't have had access to. In Yahoo, for example, we were not allowed to directly link to any P, uh, to any PDF because the PDF viewer and Internet Explorer, as it opens inside the browser and gives you file access, you can do all kind of naughty things with it. So um, it's a matter of like these learnings that we had from plugins as well, the security concerns are something that we can put into the standards right now and we actually can make a better web that is open by learning from what other people have done wrong, much like Chrome learned from what other browsers have done wrong to release a kick-ass browser when they came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. And one thing, um, I mean, I do web development with, with Drupal and so on, and um, a lot of people I, I speak to now, web developers, are still using HTML4 or XHTML or something like that. Um, it seems like HTML5 hasn't quite taken off yet. Do you think that's true? I think it's partly true because of Internet Explorer, and it's partly true because people... Um, uh, it's really tricky. I'm, I'm I'm reviewing a book right now, and it pains me because it's just one of those uh, XHTML, HTML 3.2 books from 997 that just got rewritten to put some new extra HTML5 features in. HTML5 is not a new HTML. HTML5 means that you're writing an application on top of a stack that actually uses the browser as a platform. So we, it's much more a mixture of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript than anything else. And a lot of people that do web development do things 90% on the server and 10% on the browser. So they don't see the point of using HTML5 for that because it is, uh, to a larger part, client-side scripting work as well. So um, the problem is that uh, in terms of backwards compatibility, if you, uh, if you put HTML5 elements inside Internet Explorer, you can't style them with CSS. You have to generate uh, Internet Explorer less than nine. Um, you have to generate them with JavaScript first, then you can start styling them, or you have to uh, send an extra XHTML header over to make them style them, and many people don't want to go through that. The other thing, of course, is that uh, that that it's uh, people are convenient. You know, if they learn something once, they don't want to change it. That's why a lot of like backend developers that come from uh, that come to web development still say that table layouts are a great idea because they worked in '97, they work now. So why should I learn that CSS stuff? And the the rewards of saying like, well, if you separate your your presentation from your structure, that's told that then you have the opportunity to redesign the site much easier. And they say like, well, it all comes from Perl or PHP templates anyways, so I already have that separation going on. I think partly the adoption problem is that people uh, build websites that don't want to build websites. They're totally happy doing great uh, uh, backend work, but they're not really excited they're not really interested in building front end and uh, instead of giving them uh, partnering them with somebody who is excited in building front end companies try to save money by making one person do everything and that's why adoption is uh, is not as fast as it could be but the benefits you have is just absolutely stunning if you do it the right way i mean for example forms 
uh, browsers now have inbuilt client side validation to see if a form is required, if a field is required, or if it is an email and these kind of things. So you don't have to write uh, your JavaScript validation and your backend validation. Of course, you have to write your backend validation because otherwise I can curl through your website and still inject things. But uh, you don't have to uh, repeat validation rules on the client and the server anymore because HTML5 does that for you. And the same thing with uh, uh, with uh, all kind of things in CSS that you can do nowadays, that if we started embracing them, our websites would be much faster and much easier. Gradients, rounded corners, all these kind of things don't have to be images anymore. And that means when the, when the, uh, when the design department says, like, we're not green now, not blue anymore, you don't have to change lots of, lots of images, re-upload them to your CDN and make sure that none of your in-between caches still shows the old images. So that's a good opportunity that we have to do much less work, mm. but uh, we have to embrace it somehow. Yeah, that, that's definitely something that, that I see because I uh, develop sites in you know, Firefox and test them in Chrome and all these different browsers, and I even fire up a Windows virtual machine to test them in Internet Explorer and so on. And then in, invariably I get a call from a, a client saying, oh, you know, someone in the executive office has just opened this and it doesn't look right on his Internet Explorer 6, and when I try and say to them, well, that's because Internet Explorer 6 is 10 years old or more, and you should really have a newer browser, they, they just seem to, they don't really want to hear it. So some of this comes from the clients as well, as you said before, these companies that have thousands of Windows XP machines who don't want to upgrade, so I think that's a challenge too. Yeah, I mean, in the end, uh, uh, you build with progressive enhancement. So if uh, if your thing does not work at all on Internet Explorer 6, then you've done something wrong as well. You should start with a plain HTML document that does make sense, that is, is well-structured. You should just send out things that uh, uh, re have forms that go to the backend server and render out a new template, and that's it. And then you, sl you layer on, on top of that. Then you put the JavaScript on top of that. And then you put the beautiful CSS on top of that. The good thing about that is that, uh, uh, that all these technologies have an if statement or actually allow you to test which browser is in use. So if you give something that works on Internet Explorer and looks not amazing, that's good enough for me. And that should be good enough for any person in my position that talks to these upper level management people uh, to sell it to them as an, as an opportunity. It's great that we have now these new devices. So whenever somebody says like, uh, OK, uh, that this doesn't look perfect on my Internet Explorer 6, then I, I whip up my mobile phone and show it to them like, but look, it works on mobile phones, it works on tablets, and that's the kind of stuff that your children and your wife is bugging you to, uh, to buy for them right now. So um, this is the future, and we're already building for it. So there's lots of opportunities there to actually educate clients as well. If you really work for an in, for a B2B product that only works in between two, two different agencies, then uh, uh, you probably will not have to use any of the HTML5 features. If you get a chance to actually get some extra time, it doesn't hurt anybody put these in there. I found that as a web developer, innovation only happened by me sneakily putting it into the products without telling anybody. And then <laughs> half a year later, getting like uh, uh, they can reap the rewards of saying like, yeah, our company was already uh, was already looking forward to that and we already put it in there. So... Microformats was one of those examples where we just put them in because it didn't hurt anybody. And when they became interesting, then we already had them. So sometimes you just have to deal with it. I uh, The cheekiest thing I've ever done is I had a client that was um, Internet Explorer. Uh, well, basically, it was a .NET product that we built. And it was one of those six-month projects that was six-month fixed time. And we were one week before release. And the uh, CEO said, it does not look right. You know, your favorite error message ever. It does not look right. Okay, great. So I went to his office, and he had Internet Explorer 5. And that was in 2005, I think, or something. So Internet Explorer 6 has been out already for five years. And I asked him why he didn't upgrade to IE6. And he says, like, yeah, because of all these viruses of IE6, it's not secure. <laughs> Not realizing that uh, IE5 was even worse, but uh, I realized at that moment that I just can't talk to them. And he was the kind of person that loaded a website and looked at it and then went back to his email. So what we did is we checked his IP address and showed him screenshots every time he went to the application. <laughs> And he signed off the the, uh, the the milestones for the next half year, and then he got replaced by somebody else. So sometimes you just have to work around the Luddites. And um, 
give in and say like, yeah, okay, so we fix it for Internet Explorer, but it costs you an extra two weeks of development time. And that's another great message to give people. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Actually, that's a really good argument to get them to kind of upgrade. One of the, the big things I, I see is uh, it was funny that you said Luddites because that's kind of how some people seem to see the web. Um, when I build a site for someone, they seem to think that websites are just like, um, you know, magazine adverts. You build them once and that's it and they're done. They don't seem to realize that websites need to be maintained. They need to be developed. They're like living things that need to be constantly developed and improved. So is that something you run into a lot when you're trying to advocate these things to, um, you know, CEOs and things at large companies that they don't understand that the web is a living thing? I think the, 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 the CEOs are not that much of a problem because they're so far removed from the delivery anyways. They just want to see the newest shiny thing that Apple and Microsoft are just talking about. So those are easy to deal with. Uh, the bigger problem are like small businesses that just want to do a one-time payment and then have a website that is awesome for the rest of the year. Mm. Um, my favorite example for that, and we thought about starting a developer uh, a, uh, competition to actually do redesigns that uh, and templating system that shows people it can be different. My favorite examples are restaurant websites. All the restaurant websites I know are actually a big flash movie that shows us how beautiful their, their tables yeah. are <laughs> and a PDF to download their menu. <laughs> and where I really want to go is I want to get off the bus, turn on my mobile phone, say like which restaurant is here in the area and how much is a meal there. And that's the kind of information that I never get. So that's why things like Quipe and uh, um, and Yelp and all these websites are actually successful because they give the information that the original website hasn't given. So the be- the, the opportunity that we have there is that I show people uh, uh, show restaurant websites, for example, that their Yelp entry has been is outdated for four years. But this is what I do get on my mobile phone. So if you had used open uh, web technology instead for your website and maintained it, then you actually had a chance to do that. When I was contracting or when I was freelancing, I was always the nightmare of all of my clients because I did not start work until I had a stakeholder in the company that would take over my, uh, from me afterwards and would actually have a content management system to build content. And a lot of times uh, uh, people make the mistake of coming from the high-end technical ivory tower talking to clients. I mean, for example, when I, uh, when I do trainings on HTML and I go into companies like that, like finance institutions, insurance companies, these kind of things, I don't start with writing HTML. I start with opening Word for them and showing them how to actually structure a Word document properly with headings and uh, heading styles and show them how you can actually apply different template styles to a Word document when it's been written with template styles rather than when it has been like, let's highlight it and change the font size and put my own font in there. So we always start with like, okay, this is what technology can do for you rather than like, here's how you structure your content. So when it comes to selling to a client, uh, a small client to be a successful website, it's much more important to have a good copywriter with you and have somebody who knows about content management system and really managing content and structuring content and teaching that to the client rather than selling them another like 500 pound template that looks beautiful that in a half year's time they won't have anything to do with anymore. So uh, we have we have been underbid in that market for so many years. It was always the problem with like, yeah, my cousin has a, a nine-year-old son who's got Dreamweaver who can do that as well. So why should I pay you for that? And my answer was always like, let him have a go. And then we talk again in half a year. What do you do with that? And that was most of the time the case that they came back to me and said like, okay, that was a waste of time. So what do we do now? And then you come back in a position of power and you can actually sell them something much better than before. Um, so, so what are we seeing? Um, maybe, maybe at the end, um, you could you could tell us what are we seeing from uh, Mozilla in the future? What what's coming up? What excited stuff have you planned? Well, <laughs> the good thing is I don't have to give you any inside information because all we do is actually on the outside. So uh, <laughs> that that is one of my favorite things that I can actually go to conferences right now and tell people immediately what we're up to. Not that like, oh, yeah, I can tell you that something awesome is going to come in your half a year's time, maybe, and we're not quite sure yet that it will be. So, yeah, the uh, uh, the, brow- the boot to gecko project is a big thing right now. 
uh, that is happening, and we will we will go for that. It's very experimental at the moment, but I think it was about time that somebody stood up and said, "We do this now, and we want to make this uh, this system open." Firefox is constantly releasing. It's uh, uh, it's not going to go anywhere uh, anywhere slower than it does right now, and that's something we just have to come to terms with and uh, and make the best out of it. And uh, we're focusing on actually delivering for end users and for developers as well. Another big thing we're working on is better development tools, because right now we got Firebug, but Firebug is not an official Fi uh, Mozilla project. It's just an add-on that is not. Uh, we have one full full-time person on it, but it's still only part of a team. So we're rethinking. Didn't, didn't the guy what's... just went to work for Google? Uh, I think so, yeah. But that doesn't matter. It's still an open-source project. So the, okay. Uh, to me, it's mainly uh, that we have to rethink development tools as well, and we're working on that already. Because just telling me uh, where an error occurred is not enough. A development tool should also tell me why it occurred and how to fix it. So imagine, like, instead of uh, wondering why the background is green instead of yellow, um, and having to hunt down in Firebug to, like, where the class wasn't applied, we have a tool that automatically goes through that for you and tells you, well, it, this didn't happen because we traced it back to that, that error. So instead of you having to do the hunting all the time, the tool does it for you. So that's something we're working on right now as well. Web Forward is a very uh, interesting project as well, which is basically like a Y Combinator. But not for uh, for profit uh, and uh, and just like startups of any kind, but startups that use the open web for uh, for making the open web better. So if you have an open web technology uh, product and you need funding, then Web Forward is an opportunity that we bring people into the Mozilla office to sit down with us and uh, with mentors from the company and developers from the company and work with us to uh, to actually build a product and then we introduce you to uh, uh, to VCs and all kind of things as well so it's a it's a way to get the open source world into a world where you can make money with it as well which is pr rather sweet because I've been part of like uh, things like seed camp and other uh, uh, like st startup entrepreneur competitions and they were all about like how much money can I make in the first half year so I can go to a beach rather than like um, <laughs> what do I do with this that really makes the web better so that's a great opportunity that we have there and these are just a few of the projects. There's lots of stuff happening. And uh, uh, it's just, uh, I found that where in other companies, I always had to ask people for information. In Mozilla, you learn triaging because we got so many great ideas and put them out there. And uh, the other focus that we will do this year is that we will um, much more bring the community into the main channels of Mozilla as well. So there will be more coverage about like what did our contributors do rather than like look how awesome uh, Mozilla is. So we reach out much more to the community. We want to, we want to have many, uh, much, much more uh, contributors this year and people that build together with us. So we're going to make it easy for them to get there. One of the things we're doing with that is physical as well. We're opening uh, offices in different locations in the world that are not uh, offices like uh, uh, the main office, but they're sharing spaces. So if you're part of the Mozilla community and you're building on one of our products, and that could be any of the products out there, that could be like the Drumbeat Foundation stuff as well, you can get a desk, you can get actually a fast connection, and you can get a coffee, and you can work and brainstorm with other people in these locations. Mm. And it's going to be pretty sweet. It's going to be like a hacker dojo or like the hub in London, just because, uh, just without having to pay lots and lots of money to be there and be creative. Mm, that, that sounds great. Um, I have to, to to kind of back up slightly. I have a, a question about um, Gecko. I suppose you, you're doing the whole boot to to Gecko thing and working on that. A lot of one thing I hear a lot from people is that WebKit is faster than Gecko and all this kind of stuff. Is that true or is that just a a, a historical myth that people believe WebKit is faster or better than Gecko in some way? Uh, it's tough. It's it's really hard to. It's not. It's it's yes. It's maybe. It's like depending on which, uh, depending on which research and what numbers you 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 uh, you look at, uh, one of them is better than the others. The real point is that both of them are accelerating and both of them are actually being rebuilt and being fixed and being added to all the time. So. Uh, most of the stuff that people get very very excited about uh, that gecko is uh, is uh, is uh, supposedly slower than uh, than webkit is because of startup time and that's because of windows in windows when i close all my windows in a browser it closes the whole application it restarts the whole application from scratch and we're totally aware of that there is a website called arewefastyet.com 
which actually shows how uh, how our performance is doing compared to others. Uh, but uh, to me, this is just uh, it's the kind of thing that people like to point out to uh, uh, to find one thing to be annoyed about. Because mm. in the end, that kind of performance is only necessary to you if you really, really write hardcore uh, performant applications or you build, uh, you try to simulate native apps in HTML5 that should work the same way. Of course, a new browser that learned from other people's mistakes is going to be faster and better. But uh, what uh, the good thing about it is that we're not enemies in this because we're talking about the the ways to accelerate ad- across different platforms, across different browser vendors. So the, uh, the the fanboy fight about which is better and which one you should be using is to me just tiring and it's not helping anybody because uh, all of the browsers are a choice. You can use whatever you want in my book. Mm-hmm. I use uh, I use Firefox because it has never let me down in all the history that I used it. And uh, I, I love debugging in it. I love writing in it. And um, I like Chrome. I tried Safari from time to time. I don't... I'm not a big fan because it's just a native browser that is too tied to the operating system to me. So uh, it's just a matter of like what kind of numbers do you really look at? And my favorite point about this when people say like, well, uh, Gecko is so much faster than Firefox. I say like, okay, prove it. Show me what your problem is. And uh, so many times you just don't get an answer back anymore (laughs) because just people want to troll and say like, oh, that one thing that probably hurts you, you know, it's it's like going to a conference and being a guy from Microsoft, you know, there's going to be an avalanche of dry snide remarks and clever things coming towards you. So you prepare (laughs) for those. And it's just it's just not helping anybody. It's just trolling culture on the Internet. What is true is that WebKit is incredibly easy to uh, uh, to embed. Mm. And this is why the Boot to Gecko project is coming out there. So what Boot to Gecko means is that it's going to be Gecko. It's not going to be Firefox. It's going to be the rendering engine, and it's going to be much more lightweight than it is right now, much like we did with Fennec as well and with uh, mobile with mobile Firefox. And uh, again, it's the same everywhere. The Android browser is not Chrome. And to me, that annoys me as well because the Android browser is like a few generations behind what Chrome is on right now. And, and I think the Chrome team is working on this at the moment as well. So um, it's it, it's it's a fact that in some cases, some browsers are faster than the others. But then you look at Opera being always very, very fast and uh, who uses it? And it's, mm. it's a matter of like, what, what do you do with it? It's a... There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, performance myth going on because people see the performance of the uh, of the device that they have as the performance of the browser that is on it, and that's in some cases just not fair because on this device, as it is a lockdown device, the engine is allowed to access things that other engines are not allowed to get, which would give them a boost in performance as well. Mm. Yeah, that, that that does make sense. And while you were saying that, the the kind of the thing that came to my mind was that famous saying. I think it was Disraeli or someone like that who said, um, "There are lies, damn lies, and statistics." Um, it depends how you measure it, doesn't it? I suppose, as you say, and what the use case is um, at the end of the well, day. It's the same. It's the same with browser stats. I just wrote a blog post about this. That all the statistics that we have about who uses which browser are from counter companies that people have to install themselves. You know, we don't get the CNN.com numbers. We don't get the numbers from Yahoo, from Google, from all these companies out there. Why should I uh, should I give any uh, uh, should I trust these numbers at all? Because all of them come from web development websites that made the choice to install these counters to count what's going on, or like mom and dad websites where somebody told them you have to have a hit counter to show you what's going on. So um, I'd rather have uh, I'd rather have an understanding of what my current clients' stats are, then what's going on, what's going on in the world, world out there, and say like uh, uh, blanket statements like 99% of the browsers have Flash installed in there. In a finance environment, that's totally not true. For example, so it's always a matter of like context with numbers. But right now we have such a fetish for numbers that is just painful. I was at Google I.O. I was at the Mix conference, the Microsoft one. I wasn't at WWDC because it was too expensive and they didn't want me as a speaker. But uh, they all came up with massive numbers on screen, having a race of how many of their devices have been sold last year. And in the end, that's great for their money. That's great for people having these devices. But really, what does it mean for me? A lot of people say right now that desktop is dead because uh, the, the, uh, the sales numbers of tablets 
and uh, and mobile phones have outnumbered the desktop sales by five times or whatever number I can come up with right now. And that's like comparing apples and pears because you don't replace your desktop every uh, every half year. But when a new mobile phone contract comes out, you get a new mobile phone. Of course, they're going to buy new stuff. It's uh, uh, we're we're driven into consumption of hardware and consumption of software rather than like really understanding why why don't we why aren't people allowed to buy a computer and use it for the next five years and it should be able to upgrade to newer browsers even on that old hardware and with Internet Explorer that's not possible with Chrome and Firefox it's possible and that's something that we should be thinking about what annoys what I think is even scarier is how the internet use is changing that people consider streaming video on the web innovation and I'm like no we had that for a long long time and if uh, if you if our internet is being slowed down like traffic shaping because people watch eastenders on the uh, on their computers instead of using their bloody telly for that then i'm getting annoyed because it makes my downloads slower and to me the web is an interactive media and it's a, a read write media so if you really want to do tv on the web then you should also allow me to remix the movies or show um, show my comments on my friends when they're watching the show and not just say like, okay, we put TV programs on the web right now, and that's the innovation of the future. Because the infrastructure is not good enough, especially in the US. It's really slow. There's lots of buffering going on. And uh, the danger of that is that people say, okay, the internet is not fast enough for TV programs. So how about we make an extra internet, o- internet only for, uh, for TV programs? And you pay for that. Would you do that? Yeah, of course I would. And then half a year later, it says like, well, you like Wikipedia a lot. That's now on the pay for internet as well. And that's something that I really, really want to avoid. The web should be free and it still is. Mm. Yeah, that's that is a good point. Um, so, I mean, we we could talk all day, I imagine, uh, uh, but it's been it's been really good to to talk to you. And is there anything else that you want to um, maybe tell the listeners about or highlight that um, you know that, that Mozilla is doing, or, or where they could go and find out more, say about Boot to Gecko or something, things like that? Well, most of the stuff that I'm publishing and what's going on is on hacks.mozilla.org. Um, Mozilla is completely open. Just sign up for it. Start filing bugs. Uh, uh, when something annoys you, file a bug. Don't uh, don't tell me on Twitter that it doesn't work for you because I can't fix it. But I can send it to the right people. And uh, um, just watch out because there's lots and lots of cool stuff coming in the open web. And I, for one, I'm incredibly excited being a web developer in these times. If the stuff that I could play with right now would have been around in 97, I probably would be on a beach by now because I wouldn't have to spend most of my time <laughs> debugging things and uh, trying to guess why something worked because nowadays I've got tools that tell me why something works or why something doesn't. Mm. So, yeah, watch out what's going on out there and be part of it. Join Mozilla be, uh, uh, and... We are here to keep the web open, and we're here to invite people to help us doing that. And the more people we have, the better. Mm, great. Okay. Well, I think that's a great message to uh, to end on. So, thank thanks very much for your for giving us so much of your time, Chris. We appreciate it. No worries. Thank you very much.